The opening scene unfolds on a rainy evening in a city as police forces gather around a container. They eventually open it and see a mysterious-looking female doll sitting on a chair. The following day at Seijumonji High School, a girl, Mitsugu Bamba, who turns out to be a blood-donating enthusiast, walks into a hospital bus where blood donations are done. The two nurses turn her down and tell her to leave as they don't have to waste on a pervert obsessed with blood. As Mitsugu keeps pleading with the nurses, a young girl in black comes in for a donation. She sits down and Mitsugu wonders what a frail like her is doing by giving blood. As the nurse urges Mitsugu to leave and is about to state the reason for the the test, the shy girl springs up and gives the nurse a devastating blow. The girl keeps destroying the bus as she holds blood bags and Mitsugu carries her away. Later in the day, Mitsugu wonders if she should take the girl to the hospital but stops as the girl murmurs her cravings for blood. Mitsugu misunderstands her and tells her she's too weak to donate blood, but the girl suddenly stands up and gives Mitsugu a blow which takes her to the ground. Mitsugu sees the girl's vampire-like teeth as the girl says she wants blood not to donate. This is how Mitsugu and Mai, the vampire, met. Mitsugu eventually takes Mai home and gives her blood, but Mai complains that it isn't enough. Mai appreciates Mitsugu for the meal and turns to leave in disappointment, but Mitsugu stops her and tells her to bite her. She goes on to say she should ignore safe limits and drink 400 or even 900 milliliters. Mai declines and explains to Mitsugu that not only will she become a vampire, but she will also become her servant if she bites her blood. Mai tells her she lacks the dependability and disposition to make a human her servant. As Mai proceeds to leave, Mitsugu asks her where her home is, but she falls on the ground. Mai eventually stays and introduces herself properly as Mai Vlad Transylvania and says she's a descendant of the prestigious Transylvania clan. Mitsugu goes on to ask her what the descendants of the prestigious are doing in Japan but is shocked as Mai opens up that she doesn't get along with her father's 48th wife. Mai recalls her constant arguments with her father's 48th wife. She narrates to Mitsugu how she was supposed to stay with relatives residing in Eastern Europe, but by some mistake the container she hid inside arrived in Tokyo. Mai tells Mitsugu that since getting in the container, she hasn't had a single drop of blood but she can't hurt anyone. Mitsugu advises her to bite someone since she cannot survive without blood, but Mai says, she can't possibly endanger a human life, especially when they are happy. Mai goes on to tell Mitsugu that if the person she bites turns out to be evil, then she'll just be creating another wicked vampire. After some discussions, Mitsugu decides to protect Mai and tells her to go and have her bath, but is embarrassed as Mai takes off all her clothes immediately. After her bath, Mitsugu tells Mai she can stay with her for as long as she wants, as her father is a scholar and is currently on a business trip overseas. Mitsugu assures Mai that she can help her because she's a blood-obsessed, blood-donating enthusiast. The following day at Seijimonji High School, Mitsugu goes to meet their doctor, Chihiro Chimatsuri, to take her blood but is rejected, as Dr. Chihiro tells her, she's only going to draw once a month. Dr. Chihiro adds that she cannot give anyone the blood she takes from Mitsugu. She goes on to explain blood groups and informs Mitsugu that she has chimera, blood types which can't be used in transfusions and cannot be collected. However, Dr. Chihiro tells Mitsugu that if she can explain why she wants her to draw her blood more, then she can consider it, and Mitsugu tells her about Mai. Dr. Chihiro asks Mai if she's making it up, but lands in shock as Mai suddenly appears in front of her. Dr. Chihiro runs different tests to see if she's a vampire, and she confirms. Mitsugu asks her to draw her blood for Mai, but she turns them down. After much persuasion from Mitsugu, Dr. Chitori finally agrees. Back at Mitsugu's house, Mai drinks some blood and says it isn't enough, but Mitsugu promises her to get more after. Mai suddenly climbs on Mitsugu as she craves more blood. The following day in school, Mitsugu runs angrily to Dr. Chihiro's office and confronts her for exposing her blood-donating enthusiasm to the entire students. Chihiro tells her she called her to talk about Mai. She informs Mitsugu that she won't be able to feed Mai and advises her to start a blood donation club. Chihiro explains to Mitsugu that if she openly draws blood in school, she'll be able to satisfy the demands of a vampire or two, and she can examine the blood for any rare blood types to collect. After some time, Mitsugu openly starts advertising for club members, but is ignored by the students. The students rush to Dr. Chihiro's office to register for the donation club, as Mitsugu announced Dr. Chihiro as the advisor of the club. Chihiro informs Mitsugu that all the students who came to register are boys because she announced how the blood donation club has Korean hotties and blood transfusion mixers. Mitsugu feels the collective excitement a group of girls have is usually only temporary. The karate club captain, Masumi Katsuno, 
suddenly brushes his way past the students and offers up his copious and thick blood to be drawn. Mitsugu freaks out and wonders how these people are also blood-donating enthusiasts. Dr. Chihiro tells her the school is full of perverts who can't stay calm when they see blood and eventually takes Masumi's blood as he relishes in joy. They ask for the next patient but Masumi demands his hospital care. Mitsugu says he'll get it once he accumulates 100 points and hands him a point card. She says he gets one point for every 400 kai drawn, and says the card expires after six months, making Masumi realize he has been tricked. Mitsugu sends everyone away, and says they are done for the day, but is interrupted, as the dance club captain, Nami Yonten, the cinema club captain, Maki Watabe, and the cosplay club captain, Kaoru Kono, step in to offer their blood, but deep down, Mitsugu knows they are secretly blood-donating enthusiasts and perverts. Mitsugu tells them they have to join the club before they can draw their blood, but they disagree, as they can't handle two clubs at once. As Mitsugu tries to beg them, the discipline committee chairman, Jinko Sumida barges inside the room. She asks Mitsugu why she's forming a blood-donating club. Mitsugu tries to explain but Jinko cuts her short and starts narrating the school regulation article which says aggressive club recruitment that ignores or violates an individual's will is prohibited. Dr. Chihiro asks Mitsugu what she meant by aggressive, and Mitsugu says she has just been talking to all the girls she could. Jinko interrupts their chit-chat and orders them to dispense immediately. Dr. Chihiro smiles and offers to take Jinko's blood but shakes visibly and declines as she runs away. Mitsugu wonders if Jinko is secretly a blood-donating enthusiast too. Later in the day, Mitsugu and Dr. Chihiro gather the blood they later took from the girls. She asks Mitsugu if it's going to be enough to keep Mai from starving for a while, but Mitsugu says only the three bloods of the female captains are usable. She tells Chihiro that she can do whatever she wants with the blood. Dr. Chihiro smiles and says she'll make sure to put it to good use in her research. However, she sighs and says they mostly got a lot of type A. Mitsugu tells her that's why people think Japanese people are so serious and business-minded, but Chihiro disagrees and says, there's no scientific basis for blood type based personalities. Mitsugu goes on to ask her if nothing will happen to Mai, no matter the blood she drinks. Dr. Chihiro asks her instead if Mai changed in any way when she drank her rare Chimera blood type. Mitsugu says Mai was happy when she drank it but immediately receives countless slaps from Chihiro as she tells Mitsugu that everyone becomes happy when their hunger is sated. Mitsugu asks Dr. Chihiro what her blood type is but she tells her it's a state secret. Mitsugu turns and thinks to herself, how she can never give Mai the doctor's blood because of her fear of her turning into a pervert because of it. Back at Mitsugu's home, she gives Mai the blood to drink and asks her if she likes it. Mai nods and proceeds to take another one, but Mitsugu stops her. She tells Mai the doctor ordered her not to mix the blood types she feeds her as it will cause coagulation or hemolysis which will make the blood become a mess. As Mitsugu looks up, she screams in shock as she sees Mai drinking the other types of blood. Mitsugu starts noticing the blood is affecting Mai as she starts acting like Nami and Maki. Mitsugu looks at the remaining blood which is from Kaoru and takes it away from Mai. Mai pleads with Mitsugu to let her have it as she craves more blood. Mitsugu eventually gives Mai and Mai starts singing songs as she's hyped up. Mitsugu realizes Chihiro lied to her as the blood is affecting Mai. Mai suddenly falls and asks for more blood. As Mitsugu goes to get the last blood she has, she finds Mai drinking some liquid called Beelzebub from an ancient bottle excavated in Iraq in 1982, which is labeled a do not drink sign. All of a sudden Mai starts buzzing and destroys part of the house. She asks Mitsugu why she has been hiding the delicious blood from her since. Mai flies away from the house, and Mitsugu climbs on her and they both fly high into the sky which makes Mitsugu feel at ease. Mai starts feeling uneasy and they both fall from the sky and land hard on the ground. Mitsugu uses her flashlight to look for Mai and notices a big lion close to her unconscious body. Mitsugu shakes in fear as Mai plays with the lion and they both fly to the moon. Different animals eventually join them as they ride on the road, which attracts the police force. The following day at Mitsugu's house, she thinks about how Mai is affected by the blood she drinks, which changes her personality, and how it's impossible to predict what superpower Mai will exhibit, depending on her excitement level. She wonders where Mai is and remembers she's still resting with the animals. A girl runs away from a man in a cave and falls. The man who turns out to be a vampire gets hold of her and sucks her blood. Mai suddenly jumps in excitement as the movie arouses her. After the movie, Mai tells Mitsugu the movie was interesting, as she admires someone who can suck a human's blood without internal conflict 
conflict or hesitation, and says, the man is a model vampire. Maki Watabi meets them, and asks what they are doing watching a movie. Maki examines Mai and asks Mitsugu who she is to her as she takes a picture of Mai. Mitsugu stammers and Maki asks her for the second time why a pretty girl like Mai is watching a movie with someone like her. Maki goes on to tell Mai that hanging out with Mitsugu is a waste of time. Mitsugu eventually lies that Mai is a distant relative, but Maki says she looks nothing like her but later believes. Mitsugu heaves a sigh of relief and thinks to herself how Mai's true identity can interfere with her blood-donating activities if it is discovered. Mai announces that she's hungry, and Maki says they should go out for a luxurious dinner together. Mitsugu tries to decline, but Maki forces them to follow her. After some time, Maki orders some food for the three of them, and asks Mai if she likes garlic. Mitsugu freaks out immediately as she realizes a vampire can't stand garlic, and Maki stops her thought, and lets her know that she can hear her. Mai slams her head on the table and groans that she's hungry. Mitsugu asks her if she's okay, but Maki says it might be because of the movie they watched, and explains how that movie would make anyone feel anemic. They both exchange words but stop as the chef finally brings the food they ordered. Maki goes on to tell Mitsugu that her approach to viewing movies is shallow, and says vampires are only immortal in movies and novels. She says vampires may exist and what real ones have in common with fictional ones is their need to suck blood. She goes on about their ability to modify their physical appearance and says the fact about them not being able to stand garlic is also fiction. As she keeps going on about vampires, Mai suddenly springs up and says, Maki is right, as her stepmother Rubius has deep laugh lines etched into her face. Mai starts acting aggressively, which makes Mitsugu wonder if the garlic is affecting her. Maki takes a picture of Mai as she starts destroying everything and flies away. The following day at school, Chihiro tells Mitsugu she doubts if the police will take a story about a high school girl demolishing a gyoza restaurant seriously. She adds that Mai isn't a human so she shouldn't feed her indiscriminately for her entertainment. Mitsugu asks Chihiro if Mai's reaction could be idiosyncratic. Chihiro says unless they learn Mai's trait, things could get even worse, and to prevent further damage, they should investigate. They start with their test and present Mai to a mirror, and observe that her reflection doesn't appear. They continue by taking pictures of her and see that phones can't capture photos of her either, but Chihiro remembers that she saw a photo of Mai in the newspaper. After several tests, Chihiro tells Mitsugu that Mai is different from other vampires she's familiar with, and Mitsugu says the same. Chihiro asks her to say what she knows, and Mitsuga explains what she knows about vampires to her. After listening to her, Chihiro tells Mitsugu, all she said is a product of a lowbrow filmmaker's sexual fantasies. Chihiro says they are a regional presentation, meant to rationalize the omnipresent phenomenon of death. Therefore, to be precise, they should call Mai a blood-sucking human. But Mitsugu disagrees and says Mai is a vampire. After several reasons, Chihiro says they haven't conducted the UV light test yet. Later in the day as they conduct the test, Mai says her clan is resistant to UV light, although her stepmother, Rubius, would instantly burn to a crisp. Mitsugu realizes that as long as Mai takes appropriate precautions against UV light, she won't be harmed. Kaoru eventually bumps into them and says she wasn't expecting to find her cosplaying as an invisible woman, and invites them to cosplay with her. At the cosplay club, all the members including Mitsugu admire how cute Mai is in her dress, and they go on to give her different costumes to try on. Kaoru meets Mitsugu and gives her an invitation card to their cosplay Halloween party in the night, and tells her to bring Mai along since she's a surprise guest. Mitsugu says she doesn't think that's a good idea but suddenly changes her mind as Kaoru promises to draw 200cc of her blood for her. At the part, Mitsugu is shocked at seeing Mai's outfit and says she doesn't have to do it if it's against her will, but Mai says she adores it. As Maki videos people perform performing on stage, she sees Dr. Chihiro and goes to ask her what she's looking for. Chihiro smiles and unhooks her coat as she tells Maki she is going to draw blood from the high blood pressure idiots who start advancing toward her. Meanwhile, Kaoru announces Mai as the special guest, and she comes out in a revealing vampire outfit. All the boys rush to her in lust but get blown away by Masumi who calls her his goddess. At the same time, some boys tie Jinko up and play rock-paper-scissors to know who will watch her. As the fights continue at the party, the lights go off and Mai suddenly transforms into her real form and flies away. The students wonder what they saw, and Maki announces that she got some images of it. On a cool day in school, Mitsugu sits on the stairs to eat her lunch. She visibly doesn't like the food, but decides to eat it as she says she's doing it for Mai. Nami and Masumi are seated behind her, and she tells him Mitsugu is hiding something. They both talk about how different and weird it is as a normal human couldn't pull the stunts she did back at the party. They both flash back to how Mai released her main form and flew away. Nami turns and notices a man hiding and making a video of the scene. The man, having realized has been caught, 
turns and runs away. Masumi asks her who that is and she says it's probably a stalker and an idea suddenly comes to her. At the torture club, the captain, Uemura Kanji, who turns out to be Nami's stalker, ties Mitsugu up. Kanji tells her he heard a rumor of her following Nami, and Mitsugu remembers that he worships Nami. He says he can't overlook that so he'll have to inflict a little pain on her. Mitsugu tells him he has gotten the wrong idea, and says Nami is either confused or full of herself. Kanji is upset by that last statement, and tells Mitsugu that Nami doesn't care about Fujoshi like herself. As Kanji orders his members to torture Mitsugu, Masumi comes in and saves Mitsugu. This is a setup so that Masumi can look like a hero. Masumi tells Mitsugu she owes him a favor, and she nods. Mitsugu attempts to leave, but is stopped by Masumi, as he forces her to tell him everything about his goddess Mai. Mitsugu lies that Mai is a relative of hers, who just happened to come to the cosplay party, but Masumi says he wants to know her measurements, and the type of men she likes. He keeps forcing her to spill what Mai's type of man is, and Mitsugu screams in fear that she doesn't know. Luckily, he is sedated by Chihiro, as Masumi keeps threatening Mitsugu. She tells Mitsugu that she saw Nami outside, and they realize she is behind this whole farce. Chihiro tells Mitsugu she has to get Mai out of her house immediately. Back at Mitsugu's house, she packs Mai's clothes and asks her how things are looking outside. Mitsugu goes to the window and sees Masumi and his men outside. She tells Mai they came for her and they escape through the back. They go to Chihiro's lab and she says she'll take care of Mai. Mitsugu says she regrets having to do this, but she has no choice. Chihiro offers to draw Mai's blood, but Mitsugu refuses. Chihiro insists and still tries to collect Mai's blood for research, but thankfully, Mitsugu sedates her. Mitsugu hugs Mai and tells her they can't trust anyone again. Masumi and Nami suddenly barge in with their pupils and try to make Mitsugu reveal Mai's identity. Mai steps forward and tells them, Mai's identity is none of their business. However, both Nami and Masumi feel the other has outlived their usefulness and try to fight each other as they end their alliance. Meanwhile, Maki appears and starts making a documentary of the whole situation. She goes on to reveal how she knew they were the ones who captured Mitsugu and says they should continue their action. Jinko suddenly appears to everyone's surprise and announces that she won't allow any more illegal activities. Maki calls Mitsugu's attention and tells her all concerned parties have shown up and urges her to spill the truth about Mai's identity. But Mitsugu sees Mai drinking a canister of secret blood, and before their eyes, she transforms into a dragon. Mitsugu tries to wake Chihiro and asks her what type of blood Mai drank. Chihiro says it happened when she was working as a university lab assistant. She narrates how she fell in love with her academic supervisor, who was a talented individual with a promising future. However, she says their love didn't work out, as he was married and had other several issues, so as she was heartbroken, she went traveling around the world and she stumbled into some ghost town in Wales until she found the ancient lifeblood of the legendary salamander. Chihiro says it's a terrifying fire drake who destroys the world with its fiery breath. Meanwhile, as she narrates her story to them, Mai goes around and burns half of the city. Mitsugu asks Chihiro how long the effects of the blood will last, and is left perplexed as Chihiro says she doesn't know. Chihiro eventually tells them they have to do something unless the city will be turned to ashes. They look up and see the JGSDF Apaches as they move towards Dragon Mai. They hesitate as they think about the risk of shooting it down and risk eliminating civilians. But as the decision has to be made and to avoid the situation getting even worse, they are authorized to terminate it. They open fire towards Mai, but she returns a fire of her own and shoots right at them. After being hit by Mai's fire, the jet crashes down towards the students and doctor. Chihiro reveals the truth of Mai as a vampire, as everyone has seen what happened with their own eyes. Mitsugu pleads with everyone to help her take care of Mei, and Chihiro says she should consider all of them as Mai's guardians, and they all agree. Chihiro tells them to keep Mai under their supervision. They'll have to enroll her in night classes at their school starting from today. Mitsugu says she didn't know their school offers night classes and Chihiro lets her know that the school doors are open to young working people as well. To be more precise, Chihiro tells them that starting today, Seiyumonyi High School will offer night classes. She takes her seat and says, they shouldn't worry as the night classes were officially authorized by the board of directors. Mitsugu asks her how she got the permission, but Chihiro says it's a long story. After much persuasion, Chihiro flashes back to how she got their permission. In other words, she used her sexual charms to convince the school boards, 
all of them present eventually offer to switch to the night class so they can look after Mai. However, Chihiro tells them another condition is that those in the nightclub must also be part of the blood donation club. This time everyone agrees, except for Mitsugu, who doesn't want the guys to be part of the club but Chihiro as the club's advisor will arbitrate. Jinko shows up out of nowhere and tells Chihiro she also wants to join the night class as she feels the night class won't be conducted properly with this set of people around. Mitsugu asks Jinko what her blood type is, and she says it's A. Mitsugu happily rejoices in her head as she has finally gotten all the blood types. Chihiro eventually grants permission for all the girls to enroll in the night class and join the blood donation club while the guys will be joining just as reserves. She ends her speech by saying they are doing it to continue the existence of humanity and a world peace. Chihiro tells them they must all protect my secret and orders them not to give Mai blood without her permission. As they salute Chihiro, Mitsugu gets a feeling that Mai is drifting away from her. Mitsugu walks home and wonders all she can do to protect Mai, but stops as she notices bats flying around her house. She goes home and finds a huge coffin delivered to her doorstep. Mitsugu opens it and is shocked as it turns out to be Galista Reis, who is Mai's father. He hugs Mitsugu and tells her he heard she has been taking care of his daughter. Mai enters and Reis goes to greet her, but the first thing Mai tells him is to divorce his wife, who is her stepmother. He refuses and tries to bribe her with Prada bags, but she insists on it. Mitsugu offers to make dinner, but Reis tells her not to worry, as he doesn't want to stress her and says they should go out. Mitsugu eventually takes them to the gyoza restaurant where they make the best gyoza ever. Mitsugu asks Reis if he's okay with garlic and he says he loves it. She asks why it has side effects on Mai, and he tells her Mai has had food allergies since she was a child. Mai suddenly puts on a straight face and says, it is because she's experiencing psychological stress and also because of her stepmother. As the family feud goes on, Mitsugu calls Chihiro to come meet them immediately, as it's an opportunity to see a super rare dad. As she waits, Giles asks about her blood levels as well as her family situation, and Mitsugu says she believes it's around 82 milligrams per deciliter. Giles goes on to ask about her red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet levels, but she tells him they are all normal. As soon as Chihiro arrives, she introduces herself to Giles and wastes no time in trying to extract Giles' blood. Giles pushes her back, and they both take a fighting stance as Mei cheers them on. But all of a sudden, a man who turns out to be Mitsugu's father walks in. He looks at Giles and recognizes him as the vampire, and Giles also recognizes him as Van Helsing, the University of Helsing's professor Bamba. They both attempt to attack each other, but Chihiro tries to steal blood from Giles, but he dodges her syringe. The three of them suddenly engage in battle, as they destroy the building, but the SWAT comes in time to stop them. They all retreat to Mitsugu's home, and Chihiro treats all their wounds. After treating their wounds, Mai and Mitsugu ask the two men why they hate each other so much. Giles tells them how Van killed his distant relative. The two men engage in another fight, as they try to eliminate each other, but Chihiro sedates them immediately, but also gets herself sedated by Mitsugu. The following morning, Mitsugu gets into an argument with her dad about who is the head of the family. She blames him for wandering off and says it is the reason her mom left the family, but he ignores her hurtful words. She thinks to herself how Mai is her only family, but her dad hears her and refuses to acknowledge that a human and vampire could be friends. As they argue, they hear a doorbell and see a delivery service. They inform her they were sent by Dr. Chihiro to pick up a coffin. Mitsugu realizes Chihiro plans to ship Mai's dad away from hers while he's asleep. Mitsugu's dad prepares to go to Romania to go and finish Giles off. He runs off and leaves a warning for Mitsugu that vampires are enemies of humanity and that their friendship will never pay off. The first night class is in session, and Chihiro addresses the students as the first class of the Seijimanji High School and says she'll be their teacher. She goes on to take attendance to confirm the presence of all their regular cast members. She informs them there are nine students in total and goes on to introduce their transfer student, Mai Vlad Transylvania. All the students admire her as she looks astonishing in a school uniform. After the introduction, Chihiro says their next event is the Steak Festival. She says since their time and budget are limited, the Blood Donation Club's feature will be participating in a play. Mitsugu asks what play they'll be doing, and Kaoru brings an idea for them to play, which is Castle of Vanya. Chihiro goes on to select the cast and picks Mai as Dracula, the Lady of the Castle, and Mitsugu will helm the role of Simon Belmond, the Vampire Hunter. She goes on to give the rest of them their roles and tells them rehearsal begins the next day. On the first day of rehearsal, the rehearsal doesn't go too well with everyone all over the place. Chihiro officially announces Jinko, whom they all hate so much as the new director of the play. Chihiro says Jinko's blue type is A, which makes her a methodical perfectionist. 
Jinko tells them now that she's the director, the lukewarm developments she has seen so far are over. Everyone freaks out as they realize they have to put up with her Spartan directing as Jinko starts screaming at the top of her voice. On the second day of rehearsal, Jinko screams and gives instructions to everyone as she feels they aren't doing their best. Nami sighs and says, her degree of perfectionism is getting annoying. Mitsugu pleads with Jinko to let Mai leave because she's anemic, but Jinko keeps screaming at everyone. Back at Mitsugu's home, Mai drinks some blood to satisfy her hunger. Mitsugu apologizes to her, but notices Mai isn't paying attention, and she asks her what the problem is. Mai expresses herself as she feels all she does is cause trouble for everyone, and says she's a worthless vampire. Mitsugu crawls up to her and as she takes hold of Mai's face, she lets Mai know she has decided to protect her no matter what happens. Mai asks her why she's willing to do that much for her, and Mitsugu replies saying from the first time they met. As she struggles to complete her sentence, Jinko throws a big object at her and asks Mitsugu why she's stammering. Jinko brings out her whip and starts flogging everyone and ends up destroying the house. Afterward, at the stake festival, most of the students are excited to watch the play as they anticipate the show Mai will play in. Meanwhile, at the school hall, the students complain and ask for the show to start. Jinko peeps at the crowd and says she wasn't expecting many people to show up so she must succeed. She realizes her directing career is at stake and rushes to the members and tells them this is the moment of truth that will test the worth of the night school. Jinko keeps urging them to remember why they shed their blood, sweat, and tears over the past few days. Jinko rallies her team to do it all to perfection, because if they fail, there goes her directing career. However, with the anxiety, Mitsugu looks for Mai and sees that she has collapsed. Chihiro examines her and tells them if they don't give Mai a blood transfusion immediately, she'll have to drop out of the play. Jinko starts complaining about Mai being an amateur, but Mitsugu confronts her. Chihiro looks at Jinko and says, judging from her condition, she'll have blood to spare. However, Maki sets the camera rolling as the play is about to start. The play begins with Mitsugu fighting all the other stage boss monsters, but they don't act according to the scripts which makes Jinko panic as her directing is falling apart. Jinko calls Dracula Mai and asks her if she's ready for the final play. Mai turns with a very serious face and says she shall put on a perfect performance. In the final scene, Mai appears as Dracula, and the whole audience starts screaming as they have been waiting for her. Mitsugu also comes out and challenges Mai as it is part of the script. Mai lets out a sinister laugh and says she'll play the perfect role, which makes Mitsugu realize Mai has been given Jinko's blood thanks to her seriousness. Mai suddenly ad-libs her part, and so does Mitsugu as she tells Mai to drink her blood to her fill. Jinko suddenly intervenes and whacks Mitsugu on the head and asks her why she isn't playing to the script. Mai looks at Jinko and jumps on her, which makes Chihiro close the curtains immediately. Mai keeps suffocating Jinko and lets out a scream until she's sedated by Chihiro. Jinko starts crying as she feels everything is ruined, but Chihiro consoles her and points out that the audience loves the play. Chihiro calls all the cast members and they all line up for roll call. The audience gives them a round of applause with the greatest one going to Jinko. Chihiro informs Jinko that she's one of them now as she no longer needs her discipline or morals. Mitsugu walks into school and comes face to face with Masumi and eventually slaps him, but Maki cuts the filming as she doesn't like the arrangement of some people. Mitsugu thinks about how it was supposed to be just a little independent film and narrates how it all started one week ago. Mitsugu flashbacks to one week ago as Maki tells them to reach the entire student body, they need to make a video. She tells them it will be produced by the cinema club but she'll appreciate help from the cosplay and dance club. Chihiro gets the idea and asks her about the budget. Maki answers her that she has come up with an estimate and says they'll spend two weeks filming and the total cost comes out to 482, 520 yen. They all ask her where they'll see that amount of money, and Chihiro adds that she doesn't intend on paying a single cent. Masumi suddenly barges in and reports to Maki that he has gotten a total of 500,000. They all ask him where he got the money from, and Nami says he's from a wealthy family but Masumi tells them he earned the money with his blood and sweat. Maki goes on to ask Chihiro for permission as she's their club and night school advisor. Chihiro grants her permission and says she's only canceling night classes for five days so she can film. In their class, Maki goes on to give each of them their specific role for the films with herself being the director, and lets out a scary laugh. On the first day of shooting, Mitsugu tells Maki she feels like she has seen this scene before, and Maki is surprised that she knows it and says it's from the 1973 French movie. Maki then goes off ranting about how it is paying homage to some French film and director. Mitsugu tells her the movie is supposed to promote the blood drive, and Maki says regardless of the movie's subject, the director needs a personal theme. As they continue the scene, Masumi tries to kidnap Mai and rides off, 
but Chihiro foresaw this and planted bombs in her scooter and pressed a remote causing it to explode. Mitsugu shakes in fear and wonders if Mai is still alive but calms down as he sees Mai flying up in the sky. Maki asks Chihiro why she would install an anti-theft self-destruct spark plug in her scooter, but Chihiro is happy because she can now claim the insurance money she got on it. On the second day of shooting, Maki pulls herself together and announces that they'll return to a clean state and resumes filming. They eventually get a stunt double for Mai as they plan on shooting the movie. Mitsugu asks Maki why they need a stunt double since they are using a rear projection, but Maki tells her she's not ready to risk putting her lead actress in danger. Mitsugu wonders where the danger is, and Maki shows her as they are shooting the film. The building suddenly blows up during the film acting because Maki placed explosions for a real stunt. They all went to bed as the second day of shooting ended. On the third day of shooting, they began filming scenes without Masumi as he was in a coma. Mitsugu goes on to explain some scenes that took place. Maki orders some cast members to find a replacement cat as the one Kaoru brought goes missing. A girl reports to Maki that Kanbara captured a potential replacement cat. They eventually start shooting the film, but Maki cuts as the cat refuses to drink the milk. Mai left behind for it. They try the scene again, but this time the cat runs past the milk left behind for him to drink. Maki angrily tells them they'll keep filming until it drinks the milk. They film countless times, but the cat doesn't adhere, and they take a break. The cat still doesn't drink the milk, and Maki ends the filmmaking for the day. On the fourth day of shooting, they film the blood donation charity ball with the dance club. They finally get Masumi, who is back from a coma, to dance with Mai. As they dance, Masumi almost squeezes Mai to death as he can't contain his happiness. Everyone tries to get him off, but he doesn't move an inch. He finally falls to the ground as Chihiro hits him with up to six sedatives. Chihiro says due to the sedative she injected him with, he won't wake up for a week, but he wakes up the next day. However, Maki announces that they have just one day left and says they'll alter the final scene. On the final day of shooting, the cast disrupts Maki's thoughts and tells her they are on standby. Maki meets Mitsugu and tells her they are going to make a few changes. Maki hands her something unknown and asks her if she knows how to use it. They start the scene and Mitsugu walks up to Masumi. Masumi this time she points a gun that Maki gave her at Masumi and they conclude the filming. The next day, the audience moves to the cinema with high hopes about the movie. They finally start watching the film and shout for Maki as they are disappointed by what they saw, but Kaoru tells them Maki fled away. On a cool evening, Chihiro ponders about how everyone has a secret, as she's not an exception, and wonders about her life's direction. She thinks about how she fights alone as the advisor to the Blood Donation Club, and also how she performs the stressful work of being the night school's only teacher. Mitsugu walks in and asks her why she is getting herself all worked up, but Chihiro asks her what she's doing here. Mitsugu says she was the one who sent her to bring food for her to eat. Mitsugu goes to drop the food and asks Chihiro why she is saying something about an unrewarding life, but Chihiro says it isn't something little kids would understand. They start eating their food when Mitsugu notices a special blood bottle labeled Memories. She asks what it is, but Chihiro suddenly becomes defensive and snatches it away from her. Later in the day, Mitsugu informs the others about what happened earlier. They ask Mitsugu why she left it, but she says Chihiro locked it in the fridge after collecting it. Kaoru thinks it belongs to her ex-boyfriend, and the girls get excited to know more about it. Mitsugu tells them she has never seen blood so thick like that, and Maki concludes they should find out what it is. As Chihiro rides to night class, she gets a call from the students as they feign sickness making Chihiro cancel the class. Meanwhile, as Chihiro leaves, the students come out and Mitsugu says they can now investigate Chihiro's secret without anyone knowing, but she thinks to her herself how the blood will be good for Mai if it's high quality. Chihiro says they should film a documentary on Chihiro's true identity, but pauses as Jinko comes with Masumi and asks them what they are planning. They all go to Chihiro's office and realize she installed a new lock where the blood is kept. Masumi tries to break it with his karate skills but screams in pain as it doesn't work. Mai eventually brings a man named Franken to help them and he easily breaks it. However, as Mitsugu attempts to open it, everyone including Franken gets zapped. Chihiro suddenly enters and says, she knows this will happen. She shows them the bottle and tells them she'll never let anybody take the blood. They plead with her to tell them about the blood and why it's so important to her. Chihiro smirks and says they should be ready to listen all night. Chihiro begins to narrate how she was a young researcher devoted to making some pill using old distilled blood and how ordered takeout and fell in love at first sight with the delivery guy. She tells them he taught her what youth was, but as a year passed by, he disappeared with her passbook and personal seal and left a note. Chihiro says after a year and eight months of what happened, she returned to her research and managed to create a pill supplement. 
Chihiro tells the students the supplement she made without any trace of odd flavors or unwanted cultures provided enough energy to run a thousand meters. She goes on to say that at that time, she was also seeing a man who was in debt. She was willing to help him clear his debt by applying for a patent so they could get married with the plan of building a research lab together. Chihiro says he was a hematologist like her, but he carried a lot of debt from caring for his parents. Unfortunately, she says he told her he had to go on a journey to clear his debts and promised to return with a gift of rare and valuable blood. After being interrupted by the students, Chihiro tells them the story is just beginning. She narrates how she heard a rumor that he was living in a village in the north. She says she found him covered in blood at the front of her house, as he was beaten by some debt collectors. Mitsugu asks her how the story is concerned with the blood labeled memories. Chihiro sighs and says he lost his memory and was living a second life with a young woman, and they had a child. Months later, Chihiro says she believed in miracles and devoted herself to producing supplements but fell in love with another delivery guy. This time she says he taught her that youth is eternal, but Mitsugi and Jinko cut her short and tell her to say the main story about the blood. Chihiro blows her cigarette and says, the debt man who was Tonyo came back after some months. He told her the debt collectors didn't believe his story about the supplement and said they threw it away. Chihiro says he wanted to get back with her, but she couldn't, as she was still Guy, the delivery guy. However, she regrets having to let go of him, but pauses as the students ask her who the memory's blood belongs to. Chihiro says it's the blood of the bastards who wasted her youth, and all the rest of her youth is contained in this one bottle. She turns and sees all the students fast asleep, but immediately wakes them with countless slaps. However, she goes to to her seat and shows them the supplement pill in her hand. Mitsugu appears to have been stung by a jellyfish while swimming and is bleeding on her left arm. Mitsugu trudges herself to find a doctor fast as she feels that the precious blood she's supposed to be feeding Mai is flowing out of her. However, with the capital in martial law, she stumbles into a group of soldiers who proceed to tell her details about some tanks. She tries to ask them a question, but they cut her short and keep telling her unnecessary information. Mitsugu finally gets a word out and asks if a doctor is around. She tells them if they have any love for Mai, then they should take her to a doctor. The soldiers suddenly point their gun at Mitsugu, and she asks them if they'll raise their gun against their blood sister. Mitsugu keeps thinking about how her blood is pouring out and asks for a doctor. Mitsugu walks far enough till she manages to board a train after waiting for a long time. However, as she enters the train, she notices it's heading back towards the direction she came from. A girl in a mask tells her to try sitting on the other side so she'll feel like she's traveling in the opposite direction. Mitsugu tries it and figures out that it works. She tells the girl that despite being an otaku, she saved her life. However, Mitsugu drops off the train and realizes she's at the street corner where she started. Hence she starts looking around town for a doctor as she feels she has wasted so much time already. She walks through the street and finds it difficult to move because of how it's built. Mitsugu eventually comes across a bathhouse sign and finds it weird as she has a feeling of knowing it from somewhere with the candy shop. Mitsugu eventually enters and stumbles into boys playing a traditional Menko game. She goes on to call the boys and ask about the game, but the boys on the other hand tell her to purchase her own. The three boys take a look at her and note how Mitsugu looks and sounds exactly like the grandma who is the attendant of the bathhouse, but Mitsugu says she's just a high school girl. The boys start telling her how the old woman arrived in their town and wanted Menko cards just like her and Mitsugu, wonders how the woman ended up becoming an attendant at the bath. Meanwhile, inside the bathhouse are those blood donation girls, and they joke and talk about various topics. However, Mitsugu doesn't see any old lady who looks like her sitting at the counter, so she returns to ask the boys. The boys tell her without a doubt that it's her fate from her past life. Mitsugu asks them if they believe in past life, and they tell her if they didn't believe in past lives, they wouldn't be alive. Mitsugu still asks them why they won't be alive, and they answer her again, saying they tell her if they didn't have past lives, they would be like but water. She goes on to ask what happened to the attendant who looks like her, and says she still sits at the attendant's seat at the club. They continue telling her how the lady looks like her, and Mitsugu decides that she just has to enter the bath, but the boys panic and say something terrible will happen if she does that. They try to call Masumi but are punched out by Mitsugu, as she says she doesn't want to see the doctor anymore, but wants to sit in the attendant's seat for no reason at all. Mitsugu wears a Tengu mask and goes to the bathhouse, but the girls are frightened, and Jinko throws a can at her. Mitsugu wakes up and finds herself drinking with Mai, as she is a bar hostess serving her. Mitsugu tells her she is looking for a doctor and asks Mai if she's working as a hostess there. Mai talks about how she was sold from Transylvania and says she's the unhappiest girl in the world. Mitsugu asks Mai to tell her about her parents who sold her off, 
So Mai narrates how her father comes from an unaccomplished family. Mitsugu then offers a drink to Mai, but she laughs and says, what she's interested in starts with the letter B. Mai eventually reveals that it's blood, and Mitsugu asks her if that's all she thinks about. Masumi then arrives as Mai points out, he is the delinquent of the night class who comes to torment her every time. Masumi speaks to her rudely, and Mai threatens to report him to Dr. Chihiro. Mitsugu asks Mai how much she owes her and is elated when Mai charges her very cheaply after all the food and drinks she serves. Masumi can't believe his eyes either and punches out Mitsugu. Mitsugu continues her journey to find a doctor but stumbles into an old lady, and from the way she talks Mitsugu can tell she is her mother. The old lady starts to panic and brings Mitsugu to see Chihiro, the doctor. At first, Chihiro refuses to perform surgery on Mitsugu, but after several pleading, she plays along. Mitsugu screams in pain as Dr. Chihiro installs a bolt in her arm to stop the pointless spilling of blood. Mitsugu is satisfied with it as her precious blood, for Mai is okay, and says all her blood exists to be given to Mai. On a cool evening, Chihiro introduces the new transfer student, Franken Yasuhachi, the one who helped them break Chihiro's lock. Chihiro shows him his seat, and as he takes one step forward, he immediately collapses. Everyone wonders what happened and realizes that Mai unplugged him. He suddenly stands up as she plugs his cord back into the socket. Kaoru exclaims that Franken is a robot, but Mai disagrees, and says he is close to being a human but is not. Okada asks Mai how she knows much about him, and puts everyone in shock as she reveals Franken to be her fiancé. She explains that she didn't recognize him due to improvements made on him. Chihiro orders the students to take him to the infirmary for examination. She draws a large amount of blood from him, and Mitsugu asks if that's okay. Chihiro shocks them again as she tells them he's already dead. She goes on to explain she meant he's no longer a living human and says Franken is a corpse that has been dead for over a hundred years. The students ask Chihiro if he's a zombie, but she corrects them and says, he is an externally powered golem. She tells them she has identified at least 20 different types of DNA, which he's composed of a whole platoon of humans. Mitsuga wonders why he transferred to their school and how he's Mai's fiance. As she asks Mai for an explanation, Mai begins her long story. Mai narrates how she argued with one of her father's wives, Claudia. Mai tells them she ran away as she got tired of her father's constant ogling, she says she ran out into the wilderness and eventually met Franken, who made her feel happy once more, and they got engaged. Mitsugu stops Mai, as she says, they are all confused. Mai goes on to explain that in a vampire society, the act of giving a person a flower is a marriage proposal, and they wonder how her parents agreed to it. Mai says from her stepmother's perspective, it meant the removal of a source of her troubles, and her father felt that it was better to marry a golem than a werewolf, which is their greatest rival. Masumi suddenly screams in anger and asks why Mai has to be engaged to an oddity of all people. Chihiro calls their attention after a long time and says, while they were ranting, she was busy doing some good work. As Mitsugu asks her if she did anything again, Franken suddenly springs up and looks all powered up. Chihiro says she added an additional internal battery and buffer, which will enable him to be able to move for three minutes after hours of charging. By saying all of that, they all take a group photo celebrating Franken Yasuhachi's transfer. However, they later find out that Franken possesses an incredible power. Mitsugu continues to state his abilities as his lower body was assembled from human athletes, which makes him run faster than a train. She goes on to say his upper body was assembled from several wrestlers, and his brain was comprised of a collection of several geniuses. Mitsugu concludes that as long as Franken is charged, he's unstoppable. Maki asks about Franken's location, and Chihiro says, according to his home address and postal code, they are all unknown. Mitsugu isn't ready to allow Franken to live in her house regardless of his status with Mai. They eventually decide to keep him unplugged inside a locker in the school infirmary outside of school hours. However, on a fateful night, it starts raining heavily and lightning strikes the school and powers Franken to move on his own. Meanwhile, Mitsugu smiles and watches Mai as she drinks some blood for dinner. As they keep enjoying the moment, they hear a roar from Franken as he's in berserker mode. Mitsugi takes Mai to bed, but Mai says she's lonely and pleads with Mitsugu to stay with her. As Mitsugi is about to help Mai change her clothes, Franken suddenly breaks the glass door and moves towards them. He lets out a roar and eventually hands Mai a beautiful flower as a sign of proposal, but Mitsugu and Mai fly away as Franken is distracted by her bosom. On seeing them run away, Franken suddenly transforms into a giant Hulk version and rampages towards the town. The blood donation girl comes to the scene and tries to make a plan to stop giant Frank. Mai tells Mitsugu that she'll try and persuade Frank since he's looking for her, but Mitsugu disagrees as she cannot hand her over to the monster. Mitsugu suddenly calls Chihiro and tells her the situation on the ground. Chihiro says the bolt on his head allowed him to charge himself but says the problem is his brain 
as golems were made using the bodies of criminals sentenced to death, which makes him a monster. Chihiro reveals the way to stop him is to remove the bolt on his head and go back to sleep. Mitsugu tells Mai their aim is the middle of Frank's head, and they both drop there. They finally unscrew the bolt on his head, causing Frank to stop moving. The following day, they put Frank back in the locker, but this time, leaves him unplugged. The Blood Donation Club guys suggest going on a summer training camp, but Chihiro shoots them down, claiming they have no budget, and says they were just barely able to establish a night school, as the school hasn't donated a single cent to their blood donation club. Chihiro notices the students are looking at a travel website, and Mitsugu tells her that Kaoru found them a good deal. They go on to show her a tropical deserted island, and see that all meals are covered at a rate of 10,000 dollars yen per person. They continue checking the activities, and notice they are insanely cheap. Everyone including Chihiro who says their advisor is required to participate in their training camps, agrees to go on the training camp. However, as they start their trip, they eventually find out why the pay was so cheap as they encounter different difficulties on their way there. Finally, after traveling for two days, Chihiro says the place was undoubtedly a blissful paradise. Meanwhile, Maki makes a video of the girls as they play around the beach, but Mitsugu calls Mai to head back, as the UV rays are not good for her. They all head back to their lodges except for Nami, who wishes to go for another swim. Unfortunately, they go back to their lodgings and find a very old and cranky woman, waiting to welcome them. One of Masumi's boys asks about the crowds of beautiful women they advertised, but the old woman tells him that's for next month's campaign. The students suddenly realize the one who's managing the inn is the cranky old lady. They are all disappointed, but Chihiro says as long as they are here, they should enjoy themselves to the fullest extent. As the old lady entertains them, Mitsugu asks why the guests are in the room when they have a marvelous beach. The old lady says there are lots of reasons for that, and says she'll let them know once dinner is ready. Later in the evening during dinner, they are all disgusted at the food, and Chihiro notices that Nami is absent. Jinko comes in and says she didn't see anyone on the beach, but they found Nami's dress. They all wonder what could have happened but get off balance as the old lady comes in and lets out a horrifying scream. They ask her if something's on the beach and she shows up every decade during hot summers. The old lady goes on to narrate what happened 500 years ago. She states how in an impoverished fishing village on the island, there was an astonishingly beautiful girl who turned down many proposals made to her and continued her life as a deep sea fisherman until she met and fell in love with a strapping young man who was neither a villager nor a fisherman. The old lady says they spent their time together underneath the water while the girl's breath lasted as she was only human. The lady goes on to say the seaweed wrapped around them blocked the young man from view, but the girl who was overcome with grief tells him they should meet at night so she could get a good view. The old lady reveals that the creature that came to meet the girl waiting on the deserted beach was horrifying in appearance as he turned out to be a fishman. She says since then, on hot summer nights, a horrifying fishman appears to kidnap beautiful girls and drags them to the bottom of the sea. After several arguments, they all decide to go and rescue Nami. Afterward, they record Kaoru dancing on the beach as the plan to rescue Nami includes Kaoru dressing up in a weird fish getup, but it doesn't work. They all discuss and agree that Mai is the suitable person for the job, but Mitsugu protests. However, Mai agrees to do it for Nami's sake and tells them she can speak to the fishman as a humanoid minority. Mai goes on to act as bait for the fishman, and Masumi stands ready to protect Mai. After several minutes of waiting, the fishman appears, and they are surprised as he's a giant fish with a human leg. Masumi suddenly rushes to defeat it, but gets stomped by its gigantic human legs. As the fishman approaches Mai, the boys say they have to unleash Franken and Mitsugu activates him immediately and orders him to save Mai. Franken transforms into Hulk mode, and the two engage in a heated battle. Franken successfully throws the fishman but runs out of power. Chihiro wastes no time as she and the students launch the final blow, with Maki getting every piece of action from her camera. Having destroyed the fishman, the old lady comes out crying as they have attacked her lover. She goes on to reveal that she's the girl from 500 years ago. The students ask how she has been alive for 500 years, and Chihiro says, Consuming the flesh of a merman grants you immortality. They all start looking for Nami, but see her crawling away from the fisherman's stomach. And with everything back to normal, Fishy returns to his home at the bottom of the sea. Maki narrates about the classic Hollywood vampire movie, and as she was a girl growing up at the time, 
It would not be an exaggeration to say that the movie shaped her personality and became the foundation of her interests. As she comments on the casts of that show, a club member notes how it is a waste that female casts aren't as good-looking as their male counterparts, but Maki says she likes it just fine. The girl tells Maki, although the show is about handsome men, it would be a waste for hetero men to come to see the movie, and no beautiful women in it. This has Maki thinking about what hetero men find beautiful in women. Later in the day at school, Maki seeks permission from Mitsugu to interview Mai for a documentary, but Mitsugu dismisses it, as her documentary might expose Mai's secret identity to the world. Mitsugu also tells her they have to respect Mai's privacy. Maki says Mai doesn't have to answer any questions she feels uncomfortable with, but Mitsugu says she's lying, as she knows exactly what Maki is up to since she chose Mai. Mitsugu goes on to say Maki will be exposing the Blood Donation Club activities and asks her what will happen if Mai gets kicked out of the school. Maki explains that she won't spill Mai's secret as she plans to censor Mai's eyes with a bar, but Mitsugu still disagrees and tells Maki she doesn't need her making waves in her happy little life with Mai. Maki eventually has the upper hand and makes Mitsugu change her mind because she's also concerned about Mai's true identity and wants to find out the truth. Later in the evening, as they are about to start the interview, Mitsugu thinks of how she's helping Maki make her to minimize information leaks. Chihiro complains how she thought she could go home early and enjoy some sake but finds herself stuck in the interview. Mitsugu walks up to Mai and tells her she can decide to stop anytime she wants, but Mai says she's excited about the interview. They finally start the interview and Maki asks Mai various questions about her links to blood and herself. However, Chihiro cuts the interview as she announces that their food has arrived. As they all eat their lunch with Mai drinking blood, Mai suddenly falls to the ground and is fast asleep. Mai looks at her and realizes Chihiro had drugged Mai, but Chihiro tells her she just mixed in a tiny bit of blood containing a sleep-inducing agent. Mitsugu asks her why she used hypnotherapy on Mai without her consent. She claims that Maki's tame interviewing will not go anywhere. Maki says as an orthodox documentary maker, she has some doubts about what Chihiro wants to do. However, Mitsugu says, she doesn't agree to it, and Meiki asks her if she's scared to learn about Maki's past. After some silence, Chihiro takes her silence as consent and restarts the interview as Mai is in an unconscious state. Chihiro uses hypnosis and makes Mai go back to a time when her real birth mom was around as they are running away from a witch hunt. Mai was a very scared little girl, and her father gave excuses to calm her down. Chihiro says decades passed and asks Mai where she is now and Mai tells her she's traveling from town to town across unfamiliar lands. Chihiro asks her where her parents are, and Mai says her mother was terminated in her front as she urged her to run away. Back to reality, Chihiro says Mai's parents were slaughtered as if it was a witch hunt. Mitsugu looks at Mai's unconscious body and tells them to stop it as she's almost in tears, but Maki tells her she is just afraid to know what truth is, hidden behind Mai's pretty face. Chihiro asks Mitsugu if they should continue, and she affirms. They start the interview again, and as more time passes, Chichiro asks Mai where she is. Mai says both she and her father left Europe and headed to the New World. Chihiro says more time passes. This time Mai tells her the place is different from Europe, as the city is filled with people of different races, speaking different languages. More time passes, and Mai says they are near a river called Mississippi and are surrounded by dark-skinned nannies and servants. Mai says on the plantation, she met her first friends as her father brought her a new home and friend, Caroline Irene. Mai tells them Caroline came from an orphanage, and they quickly become friends. Chihiro asks her what happened next, and Mai narrates how her father decided to make her an independent vampire and orders her to suck on Caroline's blood. Mai says she realized Caroline had been brought to the plantation for that purpose. Chihiro asks her what happened next, and Mai says she rejected the idea as she couldn't drink the blood of her precious friend. However, she tells them her father became angry, so he starved her, and it was excruciating for Mai who had always depended on her father's blood. However, Mai says after three days and nights, she finally snuck into Caroline's room and bit her. After saying that, Mai suddenly wakes up and screams. In the aftermath of the interview, Maki decides not to publish it, as it's not a story that can be released to the public, and she laments herself lacking as a documentary director. Mitsugu remains positive that Mai has the Blue Donation Club members as her friends now, but Chihiro cautions her that one day she'll suck her blood and should be prepared when that day arrives. 